I'd like to call this meeting to order. Welcome to the Scarborough Board of Education meeting. Today is October 4th, 2018. Could I please have the attendance? Mrs. Durgan? Here. Ms. Gazalanos? Here. Ms. Perry? Here. Ms. Starr? Here. Mr. Hinton? Here. And Ms. Caldwell? Could you please join me in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for the United States. One nation under God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? There are none. Um, agenda item 5.0, public comment on agenda items. Um, is there any comment? Seeing none, we'll move on to 6.0, superintendent's report. Yes, we have a couple of things um, tonight. First, I wanted to share our enrollment numbers as I do during our first business meeting of every month. Um, what you see here is the October enrollment number by building. Um, so our total enrollment is up a little bit to 2,948 students um, from the beginning of the school year, but down a little bit from last month if you've been watching that closely. Um, and then what I've done, um, as many people are interested in our enrollment, um, I've pulled out from our 2016 enrollment study, our long range enrollment study, the two different projections that we had. So you'll remember that um, in 2016, we first did the best fit model with um, a company called Planning Decisions, which is this, the type of enrollment study that's widely used across the state. Um, and then given the development of Scarborough at the time, so this study was really being done in 2015, um, they took into consideration all of the current housing projects that were underway and adjusted those numbers based on um, those projects. And so um, that has really served us as the most accurate number. We've been outpacing the best fit projections, which is based solely or primarily, I should say, on the um, 2010 census data and birth rates. Um, so what this shows you here is that we're getting to the point um, where these numbers are starting to be less true for us, particularly you'll notice, I mean at the high school it's off by one student, that's pretty accurate. Middle school is really accurate, close to accurate as well. And then Wentworth, um, our actual enrollment is outpacing the projections. It was by 30 students, a few students um, moved away this month, so we're down to, it's, you know, still like 20, what is that, 27 students there, difference. Um, and then we're looking closely at our K-2 numbers. So again, you'll see that they're a little bit off where they really were spot on right up until last June. And so one of the things that we've started to do um, in preparation for onboarding our new school board uh, members that will be elected in November is to um, re-engage that enrollment study. And so planning decisions um, has dissolved since the time of this study, but we're fortunate enough to have one of their um, researchers on staff here. So um, she will be continuing this project and actually um, it'll be a big cost savings because she'll be able to pick up sort of where she left off. She was the prime researcher when they did this study back in 2015-16. And so we're um, preparing that for our new school board candidates when our new school board members when they arrive so that we can really jump right into re-engaging our long-range long range facility planning committee um, that hasn't met really since last November when we made what we thought was our best um, plan for moving forward but given some of the new development in town we're thinking that it might be time to um, reassess that and adjust based on what we know now. Julie can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, can you speak to which schools are at capacity and or overcrowded? 
Sure. Today. Um, I don't, not, none of our schools are overcrowded today. Um, uh, eight corners, I would say, is pretty much at capacity. Uh, we do have one classroom available at Pleasant Hill if we were to add a section there, and we have one, possibly two classrooms that could become available at Blue Point um, without adding any, you know, modular units or anything like that okay. with our K-2s. And then, of course, Wentworth, um, that school was built for 900, 900. 900 students. Um, and the middle school, well, you know that all of our sixth grade is um, in the modular unit, so that school has... I guess we're overcrowded there. That school well, has the never been part, the right size. The main part of the middle school was built <clears throat> for 600. Was built for 600, and we're at, yeah. And then the high school, we've had um, close to 1,300 students at the high school before. So it's a little different there. It's not like how many classrooms do you right. need. It's really the number of students and the number of sections and how many different course offerings we want to be able mm -hmm. to provide. So um, that one's a little less straightforward, um, whereas the K the K-8s are pretty, pretty um, proportionate to the number of students that we have. Thank you. Yep. Julie? Uh, I read to a class at Pleasant Hill the other day, I think Mary yes, did I as did well, too. and it was a kindergarten class. And there were 18 children in that class. Mm -hmm. And from my perspective, that, that's a lot of children that's at that low. age mm -hmm. in one classroom. Uh, is that the average number of children in our K classes? Um, no, um, that's the average I think at Pleasant Hill is around 1819, it's about 1819 at eight corners. At Blue Point, we're currently at 21, 21, and 22. Can we lower that it? I mean, that's enormous so, in or right. kindergarten classes. So the way I mean, I thought 18 was was <laughs> a lot at, mm -hmm. at Pleasant Hill, but is there any way we can? Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, the way to lower it is to add another class. Correct. And so that's um, another teacher. <clears throat> that's another teacher. That's seventy thousand dollars yep. minimum. Yep. Um, and so, but we are looking at the Blue Point numbers because we also expect that there are some um, developments in town that will be coming online during this school year. Um, so we already have a, a family from the Beacon, which is over on Highgus Parkway, that has signed a lease to move in in November. So they're coming to us now. Um, and so we have a couple of ideas in the works for what might work with that. Of course, adding a teacher sounds easy if you had the funding, right? Um, but then it's who's whose child mid-year is going to have a new teacher and how do we well, you know, manage that transition. That's always been a problem, but I can't think of a parent who would not want those numbers lowered to 15 mm -hmm. or 16. Mm -hmm. I, I just can't imagine. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's as high as we've had in kindergarten in a long time, isn't it? Yeah, we also added two more teachers at the K-2 level. We added two teachers. Yes, I know we did. Yep. So, you know, where, and plus the enrollments from this has been going up at K-2 mm -hmm. uh, more than I think we had anticipated by the time June came, we had new registrations coming. So we'll be looking at that this year, you know, looking to see how many classrooms we'll be adding at those levels. But I have three kids in kindergarten, and not one I of them. I can't has, hear you. I, my three children who have gone through kindergarten, not one of them has had a class that's less than eighteen. Actually, that's less than nineteen. And and my well, oldest is an eighth grader now. Our aim is to be twenty or less, like no yeah. no more than twenty. But this year being exceptional, we did add two additional staff at K two, um, and. Um, at Pleasant Hill, in lieu of having the higher kindergarten classes, they have higher second grade classes. So their second grade classes are at 22. Oh at my Hill. gosh, we've got to, I mean, I'm not gonna be here. That needs to be addressed. The, too many children per teacher, K2, if, if those, I mean, seriously, at one point this Board of Education said 16 was the maximum in a kindergarten class. And 18 would be the max at K, uh, one and two. Uh, that was a few years ago, I can tell you that, before they started slicing budgets. But, I mean, this is a policy decision that, that needs to be addressed. This is handicapping our children, it, in my opinion. Well, I think it was also before we started the downward 
million dollar a year slide, to be very honest with you. Oh, because for the that's last what I'm nine, saying. For the yes. last nine years, we have been uh, losing a million, million and a half, or 2.1 each year. So I think those numbers were there before we uh, started the slide of the Well, it's year. when we lost the 10 and 12 youngsters in the high school in the the AP and advanced classes, we couldn't support those, just a few students who needed those things. And we started to look for alternatives for them. So, uh, boy, I didn't realize they had crept up like mm -hmm. that. Thank you. <coughs> Any other comments about the enrollment? Mm. Uh, another thing we wanted to remind everyone of, this will be the third year that uh, the Scarborough community will be having the community Thanksgiving. This happens on Thanksgiving Day in the Wentworth cafeteria. Um, in the past two years, it's been fully funded through donations and contributions from various community members and organizations. We'll have it again this year. It's open to everyone. You can bring your whole family. You can bring your neighbors. Um, they also do provide meals to go for folks who are shut in or who can't get out of their homes. It's really nice. It's restaurant quality, um, linens. And, um, yeah, the one stop donates half the cost, <laughs> donates the linens and the china mm -hmm. and the uh, silverware the, all of uh, what do they call them? keeps the food hot chafing, Ch chafing dishes and mm -hmm. uh, I've been in charge of that piece and, and collecting donations to offset that the other half and we've been able to do that and if anybody wishes to participate we go through Project Grace as opposed to the school district because it's it's hard for Kate to separate those monies out and then pay a vendor. So uh, Project Grace picked up the ball last year and said, let's run all the money through Project Grace. It's much quicker and much easier. We have a couple of people who have to run it through the school department because they can get matching donations mm -hmm. from their employer. So we've been very fortunate there, but anybody wishes to contribute, not only monetarily, come on, make a pie, you know? The ice cream shop across the street comes in and does that for nothing, you know? So we've had great response, it's been great. And people volunteer also the day before to set up and the day to serve and help clear plates, and then you can also volunteer for cleanup afterwards which is usually where we need the most volunteers. <laughs> yeah, the Garden Club donates uh, centerpieces, little flowers, centerpieces. I mean, it is truly a community endeavor. Yep. And you don't, it's not for people who, it's not it's geared for everybody. people who can't afford it. It's geared for anybody who wishes to come. It's amazing how many folks my age, actually, who come in singly and in couples because they want to eat alone. And it's, it's really, and we sit them at tables and they meet new people and it's, it's really been an enlightening adventure. You'd be proud of this community, the way they've re received this activity. Well, and speaking of being proud of our community, last night, um, Jackie and I, along with one of our high school teachers, Christy Zavaznik, had the opportunity to attend the SEDCO annual meeting I think it was the 31st? I think so. 31st annual meeting. Um, and it really was an amazing community event. Lots of positive energy. Um, businesses from all over Scarborough were in attendance and several featured for um, longest, longest business in Scarborough or they have like a longevity award. They have a new, a new business award, small business award. Um, and it really just reminds, it was a great reminder of how amazing our community is and how many different um, really unique offerings that we have right here in Scarborough. We also had a chance to do a soft launch of our um, of a CEF, uh, Scarborough Education Foundation targeted fundraising effort. Um, as we think about the budget for the last two years, well this is really something that Scarborough has been trying to do for a number of years. Uh, expand our career exploration 
pathways for students and really think um, outside of the box for how students can demonstrate mastery of content and apply their content in, the, in real ways. And so one great way that that happened um, last year at Scarborough was through the, inter the new internship course that Christy created at the high school. Um, and that's really inspired us to seek some um, alternative funding sources to make this happen. So it's been on our unmet needs list for two budget cycles now. Well, I'm sure it'll emerge as a priority once again this year. Um, but we also thought that, you know, we're hearing more and more from businesses that they believe in this work, that they want us to do this work with our students. They want to make sure students have workplace skills, um, those adaptive soft skills, and all of that is happening through various aspects of career education um, at the high school and at other grade levels as well. And so this is a targeted fundraising effort. We'll be doing a more formal launch in the next couple of weeks. We're working on a logo right now. Um, but you can currently go to the Scarborough Education Foundation webpage um, or follow this link here, which is uh, www.cefmain.org, cefmain.org slash career pathways, and then backslash again. Um, and you can donate right there. I tested it out the other day. It works. So if you want to get a jump on it and be one of the first, um, we would appreciate the support. We um, are really excited to continue to expand this work. And we have a really strong vision for what we want um, to create for our kids. And the businesses around us are excited about it. And so we're sharing it with you tonight first. But more information to come. And we'll do a big press release and all that in the next couple of weeks. And we were able to do this. You're very, she doesn't blow her own horn. But the superintendent uh, with Christy last year was able to make this happen because the language department agreed that each teacher mm -hmm. would take on a couple of more students in their classes to free up some of Christy's time. So it's not just one teacher. It involves yeah. many, many teachers. And it's, I've known Christy a long time, and she's one of the most passionate people I know at the high school. And she once was the key club advisor, and that's where I really got to know her. And so I've pledged to work with her after I'm no longer on the board. That's great, Jack. We'll keep you busy, don't worry. <laughs> Um, and then also this month, we, our civil rights team is going to be doing a voter registration dive. I didn't see that on your slides. I hope I'm not stealing your thunder. Um, it's going to be on Tuesday, October 16th during lunches at the high school. And Toady Justice, our town clerk, will be at the high school to assist students who would like to register, but really adults as well, if there's any adults at the high school who um, would like to register. And we're really excited about that. Do you want to add anything, Dylan? Uh, I know that Tody said that she'd be bringing a bunch of sample ballots and oh. have a lot of information to explain how students can vote. Because I, Ms. Shook, the advisor of civil rights, said that a lot of studies have shown that a lot of students who are eligible to vote can't or don't vote because they don't know how to. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to kind of try to educate students to if they're interested. Yeah, we shared some resources the other day on like how ranked choice voting works. And so I think you guys will be doing a lot of work with with your classmates on that. It's exciting. Thank you. Yeah. And has that happened at the school before? They yeah. Have they, have they yeah. Toady has gone over there for oh, many okay. years. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, typically Toady goes over during lunches um, and and supports the voter registration drive. And we try to do it annually. Okay. Yep. Okay. The chair's report. All right. um, oh, excuse me. Were you going to report on the math presentation? Later on. Later on, okay. Um, <laughs> for my chair report, I, I do want to start out with um, Jackie had mentioned that we, um, Jackie and I, and I think some other folks from the community, got invited to Pleasant Hill School to read to the kindergarten class. And um, Kate Swinburne um, invited, I think, all of us to, to go. And I read with Mrs. Caulfield's class, and, and it was just a pleasure to read with those little ones. And I just want to say the future is bright here in Scarborough. <laughs> That's for sure. We don't pay them enough. Yeah. But, yeah. They actually, it was Kindness Day. That's right. Pleasant it was Hill. Kindness Day. I had a chance to read with Mrs. John's yeah. class. Yeah, no, it was great. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, so I am happy to report that the board is actively working to prepare for our new board, which will be seated on November 15th. 
um, for the election, there are five people running for two one-year seats and two people running for three three-year seats. It's clear that this is an important election and will be a deciding factor in the future direction of our schools. So I hope that all voting members of our community um, will get to know all the candidates in order to be an informed voter. Uh, luckily, there are ways for you to find out about our candidates for school board. On October 11th, there will be a candidates night. The five one-year candidates are will be will be at the forum from 6.05 to 7 p.m. And then the 10 three-year candidates are participating from 7 to 8 p.m. And I have it up on the um, slide. The candidates for town council will be at the forum from 8 to 9. So, and that's, as we all know, what the council does is also very important for our, for our school budget, for the work that they do. Um, to help our candidates better understand the work of school boards, we've decided to hold a special meeting on October 29th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. at the Wentworth Learning Commons. Uh, this will be a time for the candidates to learn more about being a board member, to ask questions of the current board members and the superintendent. Uh, this board wants you to succeed as a new board, and we are spending time planning for November. Uh, the election will be on November 6th. This is some new information. On November 7th, the election will be certified by the town council, and on November 15th, all board members will have an orientation training from 4 to 7 p.m., followed by um, their first meeting in which the board will elect a chair and vice chair. It is great to see so many um, prospective board members attending meetings. And uh, please let us know if you have any questions as you learn more about the school board. Uh, Point of order. Yep. It, did we skip over 5.0? Oh, we did. No. Oh, no, public. Yeah, we did. No, I, I did public comment, but no one came forward. Oh, okay. Yep. I missed that. Sorry. Yep, nope, that is okay. Moving on to um, 8.0 committee reports. Um, Leanne, we'll start on start with you. Sure. Um, Are you open? Finance, we actually just finished a meeting, and I'm not going to say anything more because we have Kate here who is going to catch us up on everything we need to know about fiscal year 18. And in policy, we've actually been meeting quite a bit recently. Um, we had a meeting yesterday to discuss ABC, which is the tobacco policy, working really hard on modifying that language, bringing it up to more current standard so that we can discuss the newer devices, jeweling, um, and working with the Tobacco Commission on really improving all of that, getting more signage, and getting their support and having some educational opportunities. Um, we're looking to have the first reading of that policy, I'm thinking in the back of my head, I believe it's November, November 1st. November 1st yeah. um, and Krista um, Hewlin from the Tobacco Commission will be here. She's actually going to do a small presentation to help people get aware of the different devices and giving us an opportunity, especially as parents, to know what to look for, um, as well as some information. Highly recommend that the candidates are here for that as well, and anybody else in the community who wants to get ahead of that learning curve, come in. She's going to do that presentation, and we'll have that first reading of the policy. Um, we're also having second reading tonight of BDE later <coughs> in the meeting. That's it. Great, thank you. Hillary, anything for communications? Um, <clears throat> yep, I know. I wanted right to now? do. Yes. Oh, I wanted to do. It's, um, it's do today. A, it's today. <laughs> it's today. My flyer is available. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, I just wanted to remind um, teachers and Staff that the Spotlight Award is um, up and running. We have our link up. You can nominate people. What? I don't know. Um, so we're going to be sending that out to the schools this week to have them print and post in um, in each of the schools. Um, we have been working on um, a timeline of typical events just as a way to communicate to um, the community and as a resource for board members, like in a typical year, what happens in the fall, what happens in the winter, you know, obviously not everything is always going to be exactly the same, but events that um, are repeating, um, it just gives us a good, uh, it gives us a good framework for when things can be expected. Um, so hopefully um, we'll continue working on that and that will be something um, like I said, that the community can look at, but also it'll probably be helpful for new board members just to know what's coming down the pike, pipe. Um, we've also started working on a communication strategy. Um, that's kind of like in the infant stages right now, but we, our goal is to come up with a strategy on 
how we communicate and when in different events. Um, and then um, I'm very excited to announce we will be returning to Facebook, hopefully, um, after BDE is um, passed tonight. Um, so you can take a look, keep your eye out for any posts that um, we're going to be putting out there. And then I also just, Mary had already said it, but the Q&A that we set up for um, October 29th at Wentworth um, is something that we're working on too to get that formatted and structured for everyone. That's it. Thank you. Um, Joanne, did you, you had something? I'll have it during our... Oh, during oh, yeah. oh, okay. management oh, okay. plan. Um, Jackie? Yeah, I was going to say that uh, I want to thank the uh, Nonsuch Brew Pub. They held a fundraiser on the 17th of September for the, for the softball team, and Joanne and I went to that. The food was really good, and there were a lot of parents and students there, so nice community activity. Uh, I told you that I, last meeting that I and was at the main school boards on the 8th of September, and I gave a little bit of a, uh, an update, but one of the things that I didn't speak about is Ed Cervoni, who is the executive director of Education Maine, Maine, I can't read my own writings, sorry. Educate Maine. Sport what? He's the Educate Maine um, executive director. Right. And he was talking about working together with businesses and to bring businesses in uh, to assist in our schools. Every student needs a chance to be successful in what they wish to do. What he is advocating, I guess, is to ask business community to fund positions in the schools, to ask advisory committees uh, to have advisory committees for all subject areas like they do for the tech schools so that we may be able to focus more on what businesses need. And then he said uh, we should keep the businesses coming and they may even contribute to paying for staff and or equipment. Now, we've not had, uh, we have an advisory committee. We have a business board relationship. So I would guess that they know more about that than I do. The other two, other meeting I have attended was the technical schools advisory committee. Uh, you can see that if you're a school board member, I've been fortunate to work for businesses who allow me to do these things during the day either take vacation pay or no pay or depending on what I want. So the PATHS, which is the Portland Arts and Technology School, met at 8.30 a.m. on September 20th. It was kind of a get-together meeting and uh, there have been some buses, bus glitches. They thank Joanne for allowing Scarborough students to get there earlier than when Scarborough starts. We talk, talk, talked about the bylaws and the live work assignments, the common calendar for members who send schools to pass is a very important uh, production for everybody involved. They gave a new program update. They talked about the shortage of teachers, not only in the area, but at pass. And then they talked about the program numbers and how to better serve our students. I have always been concerned, and Joanne and Julie know this, about how few of our students go to the tech schools because it, you have to take two hours out of the day for going and coming. So a lot of our students don't want to miss core courses here to take courses at the tech school. That's a problem that's never been solved. It's not just a Scarborough problem. It's a problem with, with other school districts as well. After we did the past meeting, the Westbrook Regional Vocational Center had their meeting, same place. And many of the same schools are there. Uh, 
it's advised that a superintendent or assistant superintendent, the high school principal, a, a social, social guidance, worker, guidance, guidance, me? Guidance, counselor. guidance counselor and school board person be there to represent their school district. Mm -hmm. So Amy Summers from the Great Schools Partnership gave a brief pre presentation on the committee on the performance indicators for the tech students. You can find out about that. I mean, if you want more detail, I can give more detail, or Joanne's really better at that. They talked about student parking and enrollment, and the IEPs and the 504s, and, and how it's really important if we have youngsters with special needs who have a talent or a need, that it can be met at our tech schools. They can, we should not be saying that they can't be, and we don't, by the way. And uh, they talked about the state conference and the open house and the constitution and bylaws. So they meet once a month, and uh, I volunteered to do this for the next three months. So Joanne, would you like to add anything to that? Not really. It's a meeting that they have every month. Sue Ketch was there and uh, Ryan Susie. Right. Thank you. And we will be meeting next week or the week after for negotiations for the bus drivers. And next, next right? Week. Next week. Next week. Okay. Next week. I also have a dentist appointment, but that doesn't bother me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Jackie, so um, Dylan, are we ready for the student representative report? Yes. 9.0. So today's going to be a little bit different just because I was supposed to have someone come in and talk about the Oak Hill players' performance, but they're out sick today. So I'm just going to give a really brief explanation of what the show is. Um, so the Oak Hill Players this year is going to be performing All Shook Up. It's a musical with a lot of Elvis music. Um, and just a few facts that they made sure that I mentioned were their ticket sales are a little bit different this year where you can purchase them online. And the entire center section is reserved seating. And so you can purchase a seat and select which ones you'd like for your family. Ooh, fancy. Ooh. I know, it's really fancy. The director created the entire like diagram for the website. Um, and the, there's going to be, I think there's two different weekends they're performing the show. The 2nd and 3rd and the 10th and 11th, if that's nope. the right dates. Yeah, but what month? Of November, <laughs> sorry. Oh, yeah, no, it's uh, November, <laughs> it <was> tonight. Right. <laughs> no, it, it, yeah, next month they're okay. going to be performing that. And there, as always, are some 2 o'clock shows and 7 o'clock shows, depending on the day. Um, so please get out there and buy tickets. The links are on Facebook and school websites. And I think that's all I had for that. And the, also the middle school theater program recently announced they'll be doing Shrek the Musical for this year's show. Um, I thought that was kind of funny. I like that. Uh, all right, so a couple things to mention here. There was, these pictures don't really go with it, but in the primaries right now, there's a box top collection competition going on between all the primary schools. Along with that, the PTA has had a Sweet Frog fundraiser. They had that on September 26. Their goal is by the end of this fall to have raised $6,000 for different academic programs and enrichment activities. The Pleasant, this, these photos are from Pleasant Hill School Spirit Walk that was on Friday the 26th. It, kind of went along with the high school spirit week too. It was just their way of showing school pride. Uh, so if you wanna take a look at the photos, that looks adorable. Um, <laughs> I unfortunately did not get a chance to go, but Kristen said she's gonna try to start visiting these schools more often so we can get photos more often. Um, let's see, this was really interesting. The eight, Blue Point School had a storyteller come in who, that focused on kindness in the community, so I'm assuming it went along with... Oh, sorry. Um, I switched the slide on my laptop. Um, sorry, so this, this is... Uh, the storyteller came in, focused on kindness in the community. I, it doesn't say from what Kristen wrote, but I believe it was kind of 
correlating with their whole kindness theme for that week. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that a lot of the primaries are really good at sticking to like a school-wide focus monthly or weekly depending on mm -hmm. the certain topic. And so this is just a photo of that. Um, Eight Corners and Pleasant Hill had storytellers come too. And the Wentworth PTA posted a popsicle social, I believe another one for the third graders for this, like after third grade started. And then there will be an open house yesterday at, um, <laughs> at Wentworth. Be sure to attend. <laughs> I'm sorry. Kristen that was our final sure. open house of the start of the school year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it looked crowded. Yeah, it was. It was. Every yeah. every open house was really yeah. well, was very well attended. We're so fortunate to have so many involved families. That's awesome. All right. So Spirit Week at the high school occurred. There were a bunch of different Spirit Days, from like color by grade to we had a, a meme day, American like what red, white, and blue day. There and every day the students would dress up and. Points were totaled throughout the week on different advisories, how many students participated, and at the end, whatever grade had the most won the overall pep rally of the week, so it's a big competition each year. Uh, along with that, it was homecoming week, so here's some photos of that. Homecoming dance happened Saturday, last Saturday, and I just thought I'd share a few photos of that. Dylan, did you mention the guest performance at the, ho at the pep rally? I did not. Uh, the, at the pep rally, I cannot remember which teachers, but there was a group of four different teachers, including Mr. Buckley, the uh, new assistant uh, <laughs> principal, and they did a reenactment, or not a reenactment, parody? What's the right term I'm thinking of? Um, they played a Beatles song. Yeah, they played, played a Beatles song. They dressed up as the Beatles, they <laughs> did a whole performance, the, they invited the seniors to come down, and they, it was great. <laughs> which, song, <laughs> it was, which song? Um... Jeez, I don't even remember. Don't there was so much screaming and yelling. It was there really was, awesome. It, it was, was Mr. Awesome. Diaz on the drums. Yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Wesley. Mr. Wesley, Wesley was backup Wesley, singer Mr. and Davis, guitar. Davis. Yep. Okay. Sorry, yeah. we didn't know all the teachers. Yeah. yeah. Did Miss Ketch sing? And, and Mr. Zucker on the keyboard. Sing? Yep. Miss Ketch did not sing. She I don't know. Oh, she's a beautiful singer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The ladies were in a lamp. They the, the Beatles. They were doing the Beatles. The, okay. the kids were was, cheering so loudly. Uh -huh. I, I thought there was going to be an encore, but they only played no. one song. They only did one song. The buses That's were coming. Yeah, I know. I did a little bit later than they had hoped. But it was really fun. Everyone enjoyed it. And I was going to include photos, but I didn't get a second. It's been a very busy week. Uh, but I did manage to include this on Wednesday, this upcoming Wednesday at the high school. The jun sophomores and juniors will be taking the PSAT and National Merit Score Scholarship Qualification Test. There we go. <laughs> and the freshmen will be participating in a social media safety workshop along with uh, a rollout of the guiding principles. Mm -hmm. And the seniors will be host participating in a financial wellness workshop, or fair, uh, sponsored by Town & Country. So, it's gonna be a fun day. And then students will return to classes at their last block. But it, it seems really interesting. I remember taking the PSATs last two years, and I'm looking forward to the financial wellness fair. It'll be really helpful when students start budgeting for college and afterwards. Uh, let's see. Um, I think that's all on my part. Yep. And okay. Yeah. Put the button here. Oh, so oh, okay. I'm sorry. I thought you. I thought you were something else yeah. with Dylan. Okay, so 10.0 recognition. Okay, so we have a couple recognitions. Um, what Jackie was referencing earlier. This week we um, had the benefit of a, a Scarborough Education Foundation grant. And two of our instructional coaches, Peggy Clements and Jim Marshall, worked, um, coordinated with leadership at each building to secure over 40 subs, I believe, mm -hmm. each day um, in order to allow teachers to go and hear Dr. Yep, Yep Ben Har, if I'm saying his name correctly, um, talk about math instruction. And so we've had the, the Singapore math series in our district, Math in Focus, for seven years now, I mm -hmm. believe. 
And um, the eve in the evening on Monday, they also um, he also came and did an hour that was open to anyone in the public. And Jackie was there. I know I was there. Joanne was there. Um, lots of parents were there. And he talked about um, what Singapore math is, and you know this idea that it's somehow new math is not really what it's about. It's really about fostering greater critical thinking skills in our kids and teaching them how to think about numbers as parts of wholes. Um, and so for those of you who have children at home who are doing math in ways that looks a little bit different from you, um, he really talked about how uh, the rote memorization that we all experienced in school is great when you memorize it, but when you get stuck or when you can't recall it, it leaves students with very little strategies in order to be successful on the spot. And um, so I know myself, I've been testing it out this week in a couple of um, adult situations using some of the strategies that I learned from the parent um, the evening night. I don't know if you want to add to that, Jackie or Joanne. I just want to say I understood it. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> That's good. Other, other districts, when I've mentioned that we've had um, Dr. Bahar here, were like, really? You know, very impressive that someone who uh, did the Singapore math um, was here in Scarborough and our teachers had this opportunity which was really great and because all teachers were able to participate in it. K-5. And we never would have ever been able to fund this within our local budget so this was I think one of the largest if not the largest grants that um, the Scarborough Education Foundation has funded for us and so I know I saw a teacher on Monday night um, before I went to the parent event and she was like over the moon about it, said it was the best professional development that she has ever gone to. And so, um, you know, that's an anecdote of one, but I'm sure that we collected feedback from the rest of the teachers and look forward to seeing how this kind of reinvigorates their passion and motivation um, to implement or utilize the, the tools that the community has invested in over seven years ago. And, and I couldn't always understand what he was saying. You may or may not know I wear hearing aids, so somebody with a foreign accent, even though they speak beautiful English, mm -hmm. is sometimes difficult for me to absorb. But his presentation was so, and I'll say the word simple, mm -hmm. and easy to understand. Uh, and I'm not a mathematician, uh, but yes. as I say, I got it. <laughs> awesome, yeah, it was really great. Um, another, Recognition. We, um, as you, as Jackie mentioned earlier too, we have several community partners that support our schools. And you may remember last year, um, the the Scarborough Red Storm debit cards came out. Um, we have uh, an update on that from Saco Bid, and we'll be bringing this to the board for a formal exception, uh, accepting of this donation. But just wanted to let you know because some folks had been asking. From the debit card um, transactions, we've earned $334.56 towards our nutrition program just from the first year. Um, I think we have a, a, a total of 40 plus cards circulating with the Red Storm logo on it. Um, and then we also won the first award this year from um, the FIS Unis uh, for this program. And so as a part of that, well, they also, Saco Bid won the award. So as a part of that, they're going to donate an additional $1,000 to our nutrition program. So um, once that is finalized and they actually give us the check for you to accept, um, we'll invite them to come. But just want to say you can still get the cards if you haven't yet and you want to be able to give back to our, our nutrition program. We also have a great, um, uh, another great community partner. Um, this is Matt Bolerice and his fiance Trish. Uh, they have a child at Blue Point and an, I just learned at Open House they're having a baby. So that's exciting news. I don't know if it's mine to share. but. Um, <laughs> Matt is a Scarborough grad, a Scarborough alum who has chosen to come back to Scarborough and live here with his family. And they um, last year approached us about wanting to give back to the schools. And so that this is their realty group and they also do like flipping, they flip homes and things like that. And so Matt can, um, gave us an initial donation right on the spot. And then last year in FY19 donated a total of $950 to the school department. And then this year just gave us another check for $250. Or $250. Um, and so we just wanted to thank them again and, and bring that to your attention. Even though it doesn't require your approval, they continue to 
stay good on their commitment to um, contribute a portion of their commission sales back to the district each um, each time they have a sale. And and if they sell a home to a Scarborough teacher or a Scarborough employee, they they give a little bump in what they mm -hmm. give back. So I think that's pretty yeah. cool. Thank you. And is that Julie? Does, is there a specific fund that goes towards? Do they? Or does that just go to the general? Nope, it just goes to the general fund um, in the form of a donation. We talked with them about did they want to have a specific, mm -hmm. you know, was there a specific area? And they just really, um, Matt expressed a lot of gratitude for the education that he received here and just wanting to give back to the schools. And Hillary already reminded us of this. We do have our new district spotlight recognition going on. Um, and the first award will be at our meeting in November. So that concludes my recognitions for today. When will those? When will the? When will you start getting recommendations for that? Can that happen anytime now? Because mm -hmm. everyone's gotten the materials. Yeah, so, it's yeah. all live now. Yeah, yeah. All right. We will look Thank forward you. To it. All right. Moving on to eleven point one unfinished business. Eleven point one, um, two thousand eighteen nineteen school board goals. Um, we had. Um, oh, you mind? Mm -hmm. I don't have something to move that for. We need the. Okay. Liquor. Oh, oh, sorry. Yep. Thank you. What if I don't want you to have it? Will so it speed as up we the meaning? think about our goals, of course, we always start with our, our mission of, you know, why do we exist? Um, our goal is the fundamental purpose of the Scarborough mm -hmm. Public Schools is to provide safe and inclusive learning environment where each and every student is empowered to be a resilient, lifelong learner who's prepared to engage the contributing member of society. And that grounds, you know, all of the work that we do. Um, and also our vision for the schools as well. And um, that has been, um, has been a goal of, of the um, Leadership Council, I know has been working a great deal on the vision and that's something that we as a board um, also, also want to work towards in, in, in starting to have these goals. I, I know we've had goals in the past, but in working on these goals, we really want to support the work of our um, our students and teachers and staff and administration. And we're just always constantly working towards improvement, just, just like they are. Um, so this is the calendar for our evaluation process. We, um, we participated in the self-evaluation um, back in the spring and the summer. Um, and then we had hoped to work on these goals in August, but we kind of hit a, hit a bit of a roadblock and so then we had found that maybe we'd thought about working with them with policy, um, but then also policy has also had a great deal of work to do that kind of superseded some of the work, you know, some of the work they were doing. So then we decided to maybe bring it back to the full board again to, to look at them again. Um, so, you know, we're looking at them now in October and then um, we're hoping that um, in November, you know, the, the, we will conduct the orientation and professional development for the new board, and then in January, um, the new board will have time to look at the goals and adjust them and, um, you know, reassess. So, um, so that's kind of where we're heading um, with this process. Um, so tonight, I wanted to look again at the goals and kind of determine determine the, our short-term goals, make adjustments as necessary. Um, we also might want to decide if we need some more time to decide upon goals. If, we, if we're not ready to do so tonight, we can um, work on them again at the next meeting. And then if we feel ready, we can, we can vote to determine which goals are supported by the board. Um, so these are the proposed goals. Um, we had done um, back, back in July, we had kind of worked on these, we'd done the self-evaluation and then um, I'd looked at all the self-evaluations and, and everyone wrote, wrote goals, all the board members submitted goals and um, we, you know, looked at, the superintendent and I looked at some of those, all of the goals and all of the results of the um, self-evaluation and um, formed some goals that seemed to match where, um, where the board was going with um, with what with what the results showed, and also, um, you know, where the board members felt that we needed to move forward. 
So I just wanted to start by looking at these goals all three goals, and then later on, I, I also have the we also have this. They're written as smart goals, so we have them written out with strategic actions and the proposed outcomes, which you would want to have to, to have a smart goal, to, so you can know where you are with your implementation of the goals. But I just wanted to start out by looking at the goals, just just the goals themselves. And so I just wanted to open up the discussion. To um, I, do I need a? I don't think I need it. Um, do I, we need a motion to open up? Just, do we need a motion? To, to, to have, a have a discussion. Yeah. yeah, could I have a motion then to discuss the goals? Now, you're asking about the th what it says here, proposed 2018-2019 school board goals, yes. one, two, three. That's what you're, we're discussing right yes. now. That's the only thing, correct? Right now, right now. So move. Yep. Second? Okay. Um, discussion. Yep, so now we have a discussion. I can start with that. Um, I've had a chance to read the goals. Thank you for the time that you and Julie put into creating them. And I just want to be clear, I'm not opposed to any one of these goals. I truly believe that goals are really important to any organization, especially boards. It creates a foundation. It creates guidance for as we move forward. Um, specifically, in looking at our board, we're including five brand new members. So I think goals are very, they're necessary. My issue is with how these goals were created, um, the process that was followed. It is outside of both a policy, BBAA, and protocol nine of our operating um, protocols that say the board act as one body. We did not have a chance to um, create a repeatable process with this. The information came in, you had a chance to understand how the tool worked, you saw the data, um, you synthesize that into goals. You created how they were prioritized. We don't have an opportunity to know how that was done to be able to ensure that we can do this moving forward. So it's almost like a one and done on this procedure because no one else was included in that. Um, more importantly, I feel that this creates a really dangerous precedent because one person acted on their own and has brought this forward to be adopted it's almost as though we are allowing individual members to act on their own. And I feel that we really need to be very cautious and as we move forward, making sure that when these sorts of things come forward, it's done as a board. Because it requires seven people, or in this case four, to work in unison and create pathways to go forward. Um, I, I'm just really struggling with being able to accept them the way that they were created because of that. Yep. No, I, I understand. I, I understand, you know, where you're coming from with that. Because I know that the <coughs> when we were working on the goals, I know the main issue we had was was time. I knew like, you know, with the summer meetings, we were only meeting once a month. And then I know when we originally were going to look at them back in August, I had um, in preparing the presentation, I know I had considered, well, maybe this isn't working for our board, and maybe we'd want to do a retreat to talk about these goals more. But then other, you know, other items kind of fell on our laps, and so that we kind of that did not happen. But I know that was something that, in doing this, I I wanted to see, okay, is this the will of the board, or is this something that we need to work on more and look at more together? Because of course we did together, you know, do the goal sort, and we did, you know, talk about the results of the self evaluation in our July meeting. I mm -hmm. believe is when we had looked at it last, um, but it definitely was not my intention at all to squelch any, you know, any member's voice at all. Because I would want, you know, this to be, some, uh, you know, the goal goal setting process to be something that that we can all, you know, take part in. I think we had in-depth discussions the one time that we met. And I think the synthesis of uh, br breaking it down into three goals uh, is fine with me, but I have to agree with Leanne. It's, there's been such a time span between when we first met and tonight that we have not truly had an opportunity to discuss goals. 
conversely, I said right from the start that it is not our job, quite frankly, the four of us to set long-term goals. If we Thank need you. just a, mm -hmm. something to carry us through mm -hmm. until the election, and I think this does that. And that's why I can support this. And I agree, the process was not the best process I've ever participated in. My biggest problem is that with goal setting for the go board, it should have been done two months ago so that the superintendent and the leadership team could build off the goals set by the board. Now, they've done some of that, but it's going to be up to the new board uh, to set any goals necessary from November to June, and it should be a quick process, and I, mm -hmm. that's going to fall on your lap. I would suggest that, again, they not be extensive in number, but very specific on what you want to accomplish between November and June. Mm -hmm. And as you know, the biggest part is going to be the budget. So mm -hmm. uh, that's the reason that I can support what is before us now and why I specifically ask that we only talking about these three goals that are before us. Um, so I, I agree with Leanne. I don't think that we had a very... Um, we didn't have a very good process for coming up with the goals. I think that in itself is a goal um, because we're, you know, I feel like we're piloting the self-evaluation. Um, we, we did that this year. The goal setting, in my opinion, should have had another workshop, more discussion before it became synthesized into something that we were going to approve or not approve. Um, but to me, that process, one that we can come up with that can be followed year after year and tweaked it if it, you know, if, if need be, but um, to have a strategy and a, and a framework for creating goals, to me is, that should be our goal. Like that's a part of the self-evaluation that we didn't really do this year. Um, so to have that framework and to set it up mm -hmm. so that it can be followed in the same, we can follow the same path each time we do it. Um, to me, that's the, that would be the main goal to me. Um, I, yeah. So are you suggesting another goal? No, I'm suggesting okay. a goal. So. Just a, a point of clarification, if you, goal two is just that. Right. That is what so goal I would just, two is about. And each yeah. one of these things that are listed here are all three things that you're currently actively doing. So you're actively preparing um, an orientation process for the oncoming mm -hmm. board. And you're actively in the self-evaluation process and trying out this goal setting process. And mm -hmm. all, part of that is reflecting on that and saying what worked and what didn't and making adjustments. And then the third goal is developing the comprehensive communication plan um, that includes a multimedia strategy, which is also something that you're currently actively doing. Right. And I think the intent was because the time, because we were short on time and we got onto the process later, was to just design three goals that folks could poke holes in. Um, and then the idea that, that Mary had talked with me about was bringing it back to all of those individual strategic actions that folks came up with and aligning them to these. And I think that can be ongoing work that the board does and also create some structure for the new board to come into. Um, because as you all know, it doesn't, it doesn't feel good to come in and not have goals because you, you have so much learning to do about being on the board. So that was the intent behind it. But I mean, of course, the process can always be improved. Um, and I definitely think that it needs to be <clears throat> 
a more intensive workshop mm -hmm. type of process. It's not something you can do in an hour. Absolutely right. not. I don't, I don't, I'm not judging intent. Like, I don't think there was malicious intent in any way, shape, or no. form. But, um, but I do think Leanne's point is that when we do something like this, we should have a process or we should create a process so that it can be followed, um, you know, in the, in the next few years. And I think that, you know, there's a different, I understand that these goals are, that are listed here are all things that we're working on anyway, but just because we're working on them doesn't mean that it needs to be a goal for the entire board. I mean, like I understand that we're in the process of being able to complete these but I don't feel like that's a reason to make it a, a board goal. Yeah. Um, I do agree that goal number two could be tweaked a little bit to, to be just what I had just said, which is to create a structure for mm -hmm. piloting, um, to continue piloting the evaluation and create a structure for creating the goals. Yes. Um, so that one is one yeah. I can certainly support. Yeah, I think it, it was a, we were in a difficult situation for sure, knowing that we only had a short time before, you know, knowing that a, a, your five brand new board members would be mm -hmm. coming. And so I think that there was pressures on this system that normally wouldn't be on the system because normally you would be a little bit earlier, you know, in the, in, in the self-evaluation process. Mm -hmm. So I think that was, I know for me, I think that was a, a pressure I felt wanting to be able to help us get to setting the goals so that we could, you know, really help prepare for that new board is coming, so I'm Jackie. This has not been a typical school board year. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, we have had board self-evaluation in the past. Mm -hmm. We are talking about a new process, right. yeah. mm -hmm. but boards have self-evaluated mm -hmm. annually oh. since I have been a member of the board. And thirdly, the process that you're speaking of in goal setting has happened in the past. So just as I said a month ago, we've got to get back to talking about curriculum. Mm -hmm. That's our biggest job. Mm -hmm. We've got to run the school district. And w what we failed to do, the four of us, with the superintendent, is to prioritize our work for the few months that we would be together. And had we done that, and this is, you know, hindsight 50, 50 you know, 2020, had we prioritized, t taken an hour or two and said, all right, what do we wish to accomplish between now and now, we may have had a different process here. Mm -hmm. So uh, come November, you're going to have more time. You're going to have a full board. You're going to have new voices. And, and you're going to build on the basis that is already here. And it's a good base when you get right down to it. It's a good base to start from. But just because it didn't happen this year doesn't mean it hasn't happened before. And it doesn't mean one way or the other that this was bad or good. It just is reality. And just to speak to that, I agree that it's a reality and it was um, all done with the best of intentions, but there is no time frame for goals. My concern really comes down to precedent. It's making sure that we are acting in accordance with the protocols that we all agreed that we would act upon. I that agree. is really where my foundational piece starts is making sure that we're adhering to that the rules are there to be followed i would not want to introduce an opportunity for somebody to say well i really don't like that rule therefore i don't need to follow it years from now not today not tomorrow years from now we have this opportunity to set clear boundaries and and operate within our own protocols that's you know again the goals are good they're solid we are working on them but we're working on a lot of different things right now. It's the how we decided upon these three specifically is the struggle for me. Well, I think the one that we, I think we did agree on originally anyway is 
to do the self-evaluation process because that was something mm -hmm. we had mm -hmm. discussed. So that was something that um, that was definitely in our in our mind just because that was what we decided back in was that in June. Mm -hmm. um, Are there any other comments? Um, so I guess the question is, do we want to look at these goals, at these goals further? Do we want to have, because I know we had talked about having policy look at them, but I know policy is quite busy with quite a few things right now. So I know that was, that was what we had planned to do back in August, but I know policy has been really busy with some really important um, items. So um, either we can, table it and talk about it a little bit more at the next meeting, or if there is some goals that the board feels it can support, we can, we don't have to have all three goals. That is, that is okay too. So, that is kind of where we're, where we are, where we're at. Taking the well, I think you either vote, yep. up or down, you amend, yep. or you table. So are there any amendments or motions to table or any more discussion for that matter? I say vote and let's see where it goes and then go from there. Okay. Well, if, if I guess I don't, I guess in to Jackie's point too, like the first goal and this, well, the first goal is by November 1st. That's something that the four of us can work on and do, and it doesn't necessarily involve like people who aren't elected yet. Mm -hmm. um, the second one, I guess that goes till May 1st, 2019, but that's the work that we were doing, piloting the self-evaluation, so I kind of feel that's like that's just the calendar year. Yeah, that's the schedule. Um, you know, the third one, it, it is something we're working on and I'm and I'm glad w that we're doing it. I just don't know if, you know, so Jackie's point was to have goals that are manageable. Manageable, right. Like this might yeah. not be a priority for the five people who are gonna be yeah. elected. So to me, that one should come off. Yeah. Because we, everything else is kind of sh very short term or or in the process of being done. May I? Just because we might support this this evening doesn't mean that the new board may not add to it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's that's what the process is. In that's January, the, they, that's when, yeah, that's part of the process. Absolutely. And that's what I said. The new board is going to have to talk about goals mm -hmm. quite early in their mm -hmm. tenure. They can do away with those if they wish. Right. You can. You'll be a party to that. So, Hillary, are you making an amendment to, to I don't know, to only approve goals <laughs> one and two? Or do you want to make a motion? I move the question. You move to amend? Well, or? no. I no. move the question. I want us to vote. to vote. We ha now have to say, do you want to move the question or we want to continue the discussion? So we have to vote on whether or not we move the question. Those in favor of moving the question forward? No. Nope. I guess uh, I would have to say that my, I think we should table it. Because I, I feel like if to make an amendment right now, I, I don't know, I'd want to change some of the wording and stuff, and I just, I don't want to do, I can't do that on the fly. Oh. Is that a motion? I move to table this, the goal setting, I guess. Is that, is that right? Mm -hmm. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, um, all those in favor of tabling? Sure, go ahead. Uh, four and one. Okay, on to 12.0 new business. 12.1 um, meeting minutes of August 9th, 2018, and 12.2 meeting minutes of September 6, 2018. We'll take those um, two together. Move approval is printed. Second. 
Any discussion? Um, seeing none, all those in favor of approving the meeting minutes? Four and one. Uh, 12.3, uh, the Comprehensive Emergency Management Plan. Yep. So our Comprehensive Emergency Management Plan, um, this is our public um, plan that we share with the community. Um, our goal is to plan to ensure that safety of all members of the Scarborough School community. The Comprehensive Plan is developed <coughs> in cooperation with local public officials, <coughs> administrators, representatives from each um, school. And you have in your packet our plan um, that we um, have. The plan was designed um, and reviewed and, and um, gets updated on a regular basis. We've had it in place for several years um, in that how we work with the Public Safety uh, Department along with um, the statutes of um, the State of Maine in regards to what we need to do in order to have a plan in place. And um, as you can see, we have it, the board is given this um, to review and then to, uh, for me to fill you in on how um, some of the things that we've been doing. All of our, stat, all of our administrators um, a while back were trained in incident command centers um, and took the FEMA testing for it. And we're right now looking at in the process of redoing that with all of our administrators to redo that uh, certification. And it is uh, really basically language that is used with um, our public safety, police and fire in like the words lockdown that you've heard, evacu evacuation, so that we all are using the same terminology. And that's how this really came about in that um, some schools were using this language, some schools were using this language, but now our K-12 uses the same language, has the same format, has the same instructions on what to do when they do an evacuation or if they do a lockdown or a hold in place. So that was very helpful to train all of our staff and that this is the language that we were going to be using for those things so that if you're at another building and it says there's a lockdown, everyone knows what the procedures are. It doesn't matter what building you're in. And so that took a little while to get all of our staff and all of our kids um, accustomed and acquainted with uh, that kind of language. Um, Want to go to the next one, Julie? And again, the purpose was to provide a framework for policies, procedures, guidelines, and the structures that enables each school and our community partners to mitigate against, prepare for, or respond to, and recover from all the emergencies and disasters in involving our community. So we have plans in regards to if there is a flood, um, what would we do? Um, we also um, work very closely again with public safety to help us prepare these plans, practice those plans. We've done uh, table talk exercises where public safety comes in and works with our administrator and key people in the building. If there was an emergency, what would happen? And we practice different scenarios <coughs> and so forth. Um, Again, the common language, training the students, practice fire drills. <coughs> Each school has 10 drills a year that we're required to have, and we do either a lockdown, evacuation, hold in place. We sometimes do, okay, if there was a uh, fire in the cafeteria, you wouldn't be going out that way. So now we're going to, on the spot, just say, okay, there's a fire in the cafeteria, <coughs> let's practice. Where else would you go? All of the schools have, um, when they have a drill, Every teacher is responsible for students in a certain area. They all communicate back to the principal or to the key people there on making sure everyone is accountable and accountable, accounted for. And um, I have to say, we our staff does an excellent job. I, many times it's within four to five minutes, everyone knows where everyone is. And so that is really helpful. Our school nurses are heavily involved to make sure that if um, we're doing a drill or something was to happen, they know the medication needs of those students and what happens. Um, we have receiving areas and we have sending areas. So if there was a, uh, 
something that happens at a school and all those kids have to be removed from that school, we have all the procedures in place for how that is handled. If we had to evacuate um, kids out of Scarborough, we have places, uh, partnerships with uh, different other school districts that our buses could transport our kids there and they become the receiving school. But we have all of that in place for our staff and our, um, and our teachers and it has been reviewed with public safety. I think the next one you can go to. So the incident command system, like I said, that really gave us the procedures, policies, language that is very common, that is common among everyone. Parent student re reunification teams, if someone has to relocate, we have all the procedures in place so that the key staff who are responsible for that knows that if we are going to another place, when parents come, if parents do come, which we discourage from people coming to pick up their child because it holds up a lot of, um, it holds up the police and fire from doing their job. But if they do come, we have all the procedures in place, like they must have an ID in order to pick up their child no matter what. Um, teachers supervise those students and our school nurses again train and maintain inventory for the trained staff and coordinate the efforts. We have certain staff who go through CPR every year so we have those people on every school and there's, quite, there's several of them at each school in case um, they are needed. Um, next part, oh go back. Yeah. Um, about seven years ago, we developed a team. It's called Health, Safety, Security, and Wellness Advisory Team. And uh, this team, like I said, was made up of administrators, public safety, school nurses, school uh, social workers, town officials, school resource officers, to bridge the communication and to review our safety, security, and wellness in our schools. There are subcommittees out underneath this large committee. And there's a wellness team, and they look at our district and what we can do for wellness for our staff and for our kids. There's a district emergency uh, team, looks at procedures. Do we need to practice a tabletop exercise at maybe an elementary school? Um, do we need to practice just another drill? How are we going to do that? Um, Relooking at our um, resending, where we're sending students to other schools. Are they in place? Do we have the right numbers? constantly looking to make sure we have the updated information. Then there is um, a comprehensive um, wellness team that has uh, st got started last year where they offered different programs which were raising healthy teens. They did a, um, a night um, to help parents with um, vaping that was going on and explaining that when they partnered with Maine Health in regards to that. So we're trying to um, look at the whole aspect of our school community and work with our public safety to keep the health, safety, and security. Uh, we look at security systems. How are they? Uh, one of the th benefits that has really happened is the amount of cameras that we have been able to put in our schools and um, in, our, um, in our athletic fields and so forth. Um, so it's been a real team effort on that part. I think there's one more on health and safety. Nope. I think that okay. Joanne, has anything changed from last year in this uh, document? In this document. Um, I didn't think so, but I think I, um, I think we bolded out a couple things in Just regards to formatting. parents should not go to the school um, until. The information is released, and I think I just want to stress that because we had a situation last year um, where um, the middle school had to evacuate to Wentworth, and um, they did that. that. Everything was in place and so forth, but one of the things that held us up with the buses for the kids getting home were the number of parents who had come to pick up their kids, which prevented the buses from leaving and preventing us from knowing who was going where. So it really delayed us about 30 minutes in getting the kids off campus. And that's one of the reasons why we prefer to get the kids on the bus and go home and have them be met there by their parents uh, because it really uh, detained our work. But that was really probably the only. And also I just want to make parents aware that um, on our website, on the left-hand side, if you click down, there is the comprehensive emergency plan. You can review that along with the parent letter. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you.
Councilman, do we have to accept this? Yes. Yes. Um, move approval to accept the emergency plan. Second. Um, is there any discussion regarding the plan? Oh, it's very thorough. I mean, it's it's just impressive to see. And I've, I'm actually on the health um, safety and health safety, security, and wellness um, committee, yeah. and I was very impressed with what what our district does in that regard. So, um, all those in favor? Four and one. Thank you. And moving on to twelve point four, the second reading of policy BDE board standing committees. Um, we did take this back from our last meeting and made a few adjustments, Jackie, based on our conversations. Um, so 4.1, all standing committee meeting agendas, when appropriate, will be posted in ample time to allow public attendance and will be disseminated in a manner reasonably calculated to notify the general public. Thank you. Sure. And for the public, the reason is? Um, it has to do with, we do have a couple of committees that fall under freedom of access, and so those are considered executive session type meetings, and those would not be public, nor would we post any meetings for those, meeting notices, um, specifically negotiations. Um, 7.4, outreach and communication task team. Develop and oversee the school board communication strategy and maintain an effective communication system between the district and the public. 7.5, long-range facilities planning, to oversee long-range facilities planning, including enrollment projections, programmatic need, and the health and safety of the facilities. Review and recommend actions related to long-range facility needs. And then liaisons, serve as a means of communication between different groups connected to the school district, and maintain communication between designated groups and the school board. The designated groups are listed below, legislative, the MSBA, vocational and teacher evaluation, and then 8.0, other communities and liaison assignments will be formed and assigned as needed. Thank you. Any other um, questions or discussion about BDE? Oh, Jackie? The, the, the legislative <coughs> uh, designee, I guess, does not need to be a member of the Maine School Boards Association. What they I've been there for a while, so it's easier for me to do that. But what they would need to do is stay abreast through the Maine School Boards Association of bills that are coming forward. And we get, every, all board members get that information. Mm -hmm. Should a board member wish to testify, which is really better uh, than the superintendent, because the legislators themselves will listen more to elected officials than employees. So it's an important committee uh, when we're talking about educational issues. You've got to make the contacts. You've got to make yourself go to Augusta and meet the commissioner and, and the players on main school boards, who's there pushing the agenda. And, so we've been able to do that before I was on, by the way. We had a couple of people who, who did that as well. So uh, it's just a heads up. Thank you. Jack, you've served us well in that position. Pardon me? Well. You have served us well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or discussion about BD? Are we ready for a vote? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's well done. Yep, it looks, looks great. Uh, so all those in favor of? Um, BDE, four and one. Twelve point five appointments. Um, Twelve point five point one. The Maine School Board Association delegate. Um, this is um, every year we have a conference. Um, the, the Maine School Boards Association has a conference up in Augusta in October, and so at that um, conference they have a um, meeting at which they talk about some of the issues that are facing the schools and vote on how the uh, main school boards would choose to um, support or not support certain um, legislative items coming up. So every year we have a delegate to that um, meeting and so we need to nominate someone for that position. Uh, do I have a nomination? <laughs> I nominate Hillary. 
Do I have a second? Second. Uh, any discussion? Hillary, do you accept? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All it's right. not a hard job. Yeah, no, no, that's it's what really, they keep telling me. So. Yeah, no, yeah, and I, I, I did. It I will last, be I there yes. because I'm on the board. Yeah. So, and I did it last year because pretty much they'll they'll talk about things that and you vote. And you, yeah, I think you hold up a little paddle. <laughs> oh well, I, then I definitely accept. It, yes. <laughs> um, but um, okay, so um, all those in favor of um, Hillary Durgan being our delegate four and one. Uh, 12 Congratulations, Hillary. Thank yes. you. Yes. <laughs> 12.5.2, Pleasant Hills School Learning Lead Teacher. Um, the recommendation is to approve Kate Swinburne as the Pleasant Hill Learning Lead Teacher to be funded through the general fund. We'd like to take that together with the 12 point, or yeah. does that need to be separate? Okay. Um, uh, any discussion? Or actually, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Um, seeing none, all those in favor? Four and one. Uh, moving on to 12.5.3, high school co-curricular appointments. The recommendation is to approve the high school co-curricular positions as printed. Um, and you'll notice that the majority are funded through the general fund. There are still a few vacancies. Um, and we're also looking for volunteers. So if anyone wants to be a set builder or um, a mock trial advisor or a mock trial attorney coach, storm for a cure advisor, we're looking for volunteers. All right. Uh, do I have a motion? The move approval is printed. Second. Uh, any discussion? Um, all those in favor? Four and one. Mary, but before we move oh, yes. on, may I make a statement? When, when the resolutions come out from main school boards, we should all review them and give Hillary mm -hmm. uh, the sense of how she should vote on those. Thank you. I'll bring you lots of candy. 12.6, um, the FY18 year end financial report. We have Kate. Fulton. Are you driving and the... I'm driving. Oh, no, you can drive. Oh, just here. Oh, a clicker? Oh, you don't want to give me that kind of power. <laughs> what do I point it at? My Me. Lady. So, um, before I start, I do have a bunch of handouts, and I know we still have some very patient folks. Okay, nobody can hear you unless you're at the mic. I've got a ton of handouts here for the folks that have been patiently waiting through the evening. And what I'm going to do is sort of just hand them to you. my friend here who can grab one of each and pass them out um, because it will help people follow along as, as I'm going through. Hi. Tonight we're talking about the end of fiscal year 18, even though we're just finishing the first quarter of fiscal 19. Julie and I kind of laugh that we're never in the right year at the right time. We're always looking backwards or looking forwards, and that's particularly true in my department. Um, but we do have some uh, items that we need to do on the agenda tonight for uh, the end of fiscal 18 and to close things out. So this is my opportunity to give you a little report out on um, the financial picture at the end of the year. Um, I know we have a pretty full agenda tonight. We're probably all getting sleepy, so I'm not going to give you one of my Ken Burns-style recaps of the full year <laughs> and uh, in glowing history, but uh, I did put a few notes up here about um, some of the things we've been thinking about in fiscal 18. A lot of them sort of echo the comments that have been made tonight by the board, so I feel like I was kind of hitting the right tone, and uh, I did just want to point out that this is one of many opportunities we have to talk in public about the budget and about finance and school spending. And so um, this is just a piece of that communication, but that um, we do try to post everything on our website as well. So for folks who are not with us this evening or watching this program, um, they can still see the financial information and kind of follow along with what we're doing. Um, and uh, during the budget development process in, for fiscal 19, we added a lot of community outreach pieces that we're continuing with as well. So people should keep focused and 
and uh, pay attention to those and take advantage of those. All right, so I have to be really coordinated here. Let's see if I can do this. Um, so I'm going to dive right into the year-end financial statement. Um, there's th uh, three handouts. One is the, the copies of the slides, the PowerPoint, so you can just watch along on slides um, if you're here in the room with me. And then there's a, another handout that starts with uh, sort of a narrative. It's got notes and comments at the top. I'm not going to read you the notes and comments because I'm basically telling you the story myself here in the room. Uh, but this is intended so that someone who goes and looks this report up online later on and doesn't see this presentation can also understand and follow along and figure out some context and, and some markers for what to look for in the report. So uh, the handout that starts with notes and comments, if you flip to page three, um, you'll start to see the beginning of the financial statement. We start off here on this slide with a big picture transition from the beginning of fiscal year 18 to the end. It shows the general fund change. Um, this chart is actually found, it's actually not too hard to see. Some of these slides are small. This one's found at the top of page four of the financial statement. Um, at the top is the start of the fiscal year. We committed the bulk of our available fund balance as non-tax revenue for the FY18 budget. So we started with a $2.3 million surplus and we spent essentially 2.1 million of that in building the FY18 budget. So our unassigned fund balance, our available fund balance that wasn't allocated for anything was the 243,000 at the beginning of fiscal 18. The middle of this chart shows you what happened during the course of fiscal year 18. Appropriations balance means money that we had left over at the end of the year on the expenditure side of the budget. The revenue balance is a small shortfall. Year-end adjustments we'll talk about as we go through the presentation, but that's another reduction. So that the year-end balance for fiscal 18 is $724,000. We can then add that to the 243 that we had at the beginning of the year and we have a total available fund balance of 968,705. You'll probably remember if you followed along on the fiscal year 19 budget development that we committed $500,000 of fund balance to support fiscal 19, the year we're in right now. So what that means is that we can say we have $468,705 available that's not in use right now, not allocated to any purpose, at the end of fiscal 18. And as I said in finance earlier, that makes me do a little dance. That's great. That's, that's a really nice number. It's a higher number than what we expected, and we're happy about that. Um, it is, unfortunately, it's only 0.99% of the fiscal 18 budget, general fund budget. It's not you know, big bucks, but it's big bucks to me, and it's more bucks than I thought I would have. So, so now we're going to get into the details. Uh, the first section of financial statement on page three, um, that's the one that has notes and comments on it, uh, that is called general fund appropriations, which is a fancy way of saying budget to actual expenditures. You'll see there was that large budget surplus at year end. It's a million sixty-six. And we were able to achieve that through a combination of strategic efforts and then some other less intentional circumstances. This slide shows you, it talks about the curtailment plan that we developed. Um, the Leadership Council came together immediately after the fiscal 18 budget finally passed at referendum in September of 2017. We knew we were headed into building a budget for fiscal year 19 facing a large revenue gap. We used that $2.1 million, remember on that last slide, to fund the fiscal 19 budget, or the fiscal 18 budget. So we really didn't have a lot left in the pot. And so the Leadership Council said, if we put a spending curtailment in place right at the beginning of fiscal 18, we're going to try to maximize our fund balance at the end of the year so we can rebuild that pot. And that's where I got to do the dance about the $460,000. Uh, strategic curtailment efforts. We identified about $350,000 worth of possible savings, targeted for potential savings, both on the instructional side and on the operation side. The slide kind of lays out some of the things that we talked about, 
professional development opportunities. We stopped or slowed some of those. We stopped or slowed or deferred purchase of non-essential supplies, books, and equipment. This basically shows you the areas where we were trying to save some funding. Um, there was one staffing position that we deferred, the special education behavior specialist. Um, and just a footnote to that, we ended up uh, sort of re reworking that position in fiscal 19 into an, in an ed tech position at the moment. Um, so on the next slide, talk about operations. Just the only thing I would add about that special ed position, it's not that we were choosing to not provide a service to students in any sort of way. That was actually, a, we couldn't find a person that was qualified for that position. And that's why in FY19, we decided to sort of grow our own with an ed tech. Right, <clears throat> and we were able to find an excellent uh, staff member to do that work. Yep. Um, and she's a bargain, isn't that, isn't that wonderful? Um, so on the, on the operations side, we, we, um, we really made this commitment as a leadership council across the whole group, the whole team, um, from facilities to transportation to all of the buildings, uh, administrators, and all the instructional programs and special services. On the operations side, facilities um, said that they would try to uh, go without some of the more discretionary contracted services, um, cut back on some of the non-essential um, sort of maintenance and, and upgrades that they would typically do. Technology, same thing. Supplies and services for system admin, health services and transportation. Um, and again, we all identified areas where we thought we could save some money right up front. Um, school leaders always strive to come in under budget by a small margin in their discretionary accounts. We're not allowed to spend more than what our budget says we can spend. So it's, it's normal operating procedure to try to come in under budget. What we did was to expand that and to commit to try and come in considerably under budget. Then you've got some areas where we had some unplanned circumstances. There are some regular cost fluctuations that happen with staff turnover. Um, I won't say these are lucky breaks because in some cases it meant that we were doing without, we were operating under less than ideal conditions, uh, but we did save some money. As you know, well, I think you've got to know because I keep saying it, uh, about 76% of our budget is people, staff, uh, personnel costs. And that's, that was true in FY18. So personnel turnover and benefit changes typically account for one or two hundred thousand dollars. In fiscal 18, we were in under budget by just about three hundred thousand dollars. Some of that was pretty normal turnover savings, um, but there were a couple of situations where we had folks who left positions mid-year. We had some long-term <coughs> leaves with uh, long-term leaves with reduced pay. We had some positions that sat unfilled for a little while. So it was a little bit more of um, unspent funds than we would typically see. Um, and then there were also, there was also $30,000 specifically set aside to, for our tech ed techs um, to put some extra hours into their day uh, and their year. And we actually reworked that completely, which you may remember from the budget discussions for fiscal 19, and ended up changing our minds and turning those into IT positions. Um, so that was a little bit of a chunk there, that $30,000. In the transportation department, um, one of our favorite topics. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's where I say, you know, it's, it's, it's not a lucky break that you can't hire enough bus drivers. It's, uh, it's really unfortunate and it's really stressful. And, you know, we've been doing our best and struggling with that for a number of years now. But, hey, we made money. We saved money. Isn't that great? Uh, we saved about $125,000 in wages and benefits about $75,000 in vehicle maintenance and fuel, only because we are not putting all of our buses on the road. Um, we're budgeting for full staff and full, full production, and if we cannot accomplish that, then you know, obviously we're not spending that money. A portion of these savings will be used to offset the unbudgeted cost of contracted service transportation for athletics and activities, and we'll be talking about that later with budget transfers. 
Um, and the rest of the expenditure surplus is just made up of normal incremental savings throughout the operating budget. But this gives you the sort of the big chunks <coughs> of savings. Um, as the board knows, I believe they are required by policy DBJ to vote approval of budget transfers at the end of the year for any individual account overspent by $10,000 or more. We have about 655 expense accounts in our general fund. And this year we have 10 of them, which came in over budget. So, you know, not bad. Not, uh, not gonna do the dance on that one, but you know, it's, it's not bad. Um, there are 10 accounts that will need year-end transfers. And we have a packet that talks about the, the year-end transfers. It's the sort of, it's the only one that you have there that, that's got the Easter colors that I'm famous for. Um, the, the sort of pink and green and, and yellow. And we're gonna dive into that one a little bit so we can talk about what the budget transfers look like. So on that cheerful color chart, page one, uh, it's uh, divided into sections by the voter referendum category of the accounts with deficits. So what we look at on that chart is a deficit in an account is, uh, is highlighted in pink. And then our requirement, our, our task this evening is to say, oh, well, we're gonna cover that deficit with funds from another budget line, and we're gonna make an official transfer that says, okay, now that, that line's okay now. Um, so the green lines are the ones where we're, we're pulling the funds from um, to cover those deficits. They're divided, uh, the chart is divided into categories based on the voter categories that we use in the public referendum. So when the voters go to the polls, there are 11 categories stated for them, and each of those categories has an amount to it, and then the bottom line of the budget that they're voting for. So bear with me for a second here, because somewhere in all of this paper, there it is. We're gonna take a look at a chunk of accounts that are salaries and benefits. And um, those are ones that have a little bit of a, of a deficit to them and that we're gonna cover with other salary and benefit lines. And what we typically try to do is if, if you follow the color coding, we typically try to keep the uh, green lines, which are surpluses available in the same voter category as the deficit. Um, so in regular instruction, which is the first chunk on that page, we've got some lines that are over budget, we have some lines that are under budget. We have the money to move from one to the other, and so that's what we try to do. We try to keep similar accounts together, um, and we try to keep the voter categories together. So salaries and benefits, uh, we talked a little bit about this in finance. Um, when you build a budget 18 months before the end of the fiscal year, you have turnover and you have some um, typical changes in those lines. So most years we see changes in salary and benefit lines overall. Um, and we talked about the fact that if there's only one or two employees or 10 employees in any given GL account, um, general ledger account, that somebody leaving and somebody new coming can make a drastic difference. If somebody leaves and that person has um, uh, no benefits and the new person comes on board and has family benefits, that's $15,000 right there. So um, a lot of the lines that, that get into trouble are lines that only have one or two people in them and then you have turnover that makes it look like a drastic change. So that's the first chunk. The second chunk is special education. In this particular case, uh, we have a, a DOE requirement that was added last year that splits uh, some of the costs of special purpose private schools from tuition to tuition and services. And in the, in the old days, we would put everything under tuition and we would pay um, the Morrison Center a bill and it all went in one account. So due to these changes, we need to have a separate contracted services line for things like speech and OT and extra ed tech help and then one just for tuition. So this is really kind of a, a housekeeping transfer, but what we're doing is we're covering the contracted services line, which we didn't expect to have those costs in, and um, making that whole by using some money from tuition as well as some money from teacher salaries. 
the next section is athletics contracted transportation, which I touched on a minute ago. And uh, that one is um, uh, due entirely to our difficulties with putting buses on the road with employee drivers in them. Uh, we've been contracting for athletics principally, and um, it's an expenditure that was certainly not expected in the athletics department, but that's where the expenditure is coded to. So what we've done there, you'll see that the coding there is yellow, which means that the surplus, the budget transfer, is coming from a different voter category. Um, in this case, transportation is the obvious place to take the funding from to pay for transportation and athletics. So we're taking the bulk of it from there, but this is where you get a little footnote. Um, the state statute says, and this is actually printed at the bottom of page two of this packet, that during the year in which the budget is approved, you can't transfer more than 5% of any voter category out of that category. And that's designed, that statute's designed to um, protect the will of the voters. So if the voters go to the polls and say, I want this much money to be spent on transportation and I want this much money to be spent on facilities, that we can't just willy-nilly say, well, no, we're actually really, we actually really, really want to put it all in facilities. Um, so in order to protect the will of the voters, you can't transfer more than 5% out of any category. So in this case, you'll see that transportation covers almost all of the driver short of all of the um, shortfall in contracted transportation, but that we also took a smidge out of system administration so that we wouldn't go more than 5% uh, uh, out of the transportation department. The next line is Wentworth Services, uh, Wentworth, Wentworth Building, Contracted Repairs and Maintenance. Wentworth is a new building, still, opened in 2014. Um, we're still calling it the new middle school. Joanne laughs at that one. Uh, that's only, what, 25 years 20 now? Years old. Uh, but the, the new Wentworth Building, we, we've been gradually increasing the operating budget and facilities because when a building is brand new, you have a lot of um, systems and and uh, equipment that's under warranty. Um, you don't necessarily have the same level of expenditure in a brand new building once you've paid for it that you would in an older building. Um, we've gotten to the point now where regular repairs and, and maintenance and upkeep actually exceeded our budgeted amount in fiscal 18, which was $100,000. Um, so in fiscal 19, we saw that coming and we, we budgeted $125,000. So I think we'll be fine for this year. But what we've done for fiscal 18 is we've taken a little money out of the middle school line, which happened to come in under budget. Debt service uh, is a voter category that only has two expenditure lines in it. One is interest and one is principal. So there's not really a lot of room to move if you don't get your estimates right for debt service. Um, we got a, an estimate from the town, a preliminary estimate that we put into our budget for what our debt service costs would be and the interest was actually over that by $10,836. So since there's no place to take that from the debt service voter category, we again went to system administration and uh, grabbed $10,000 10, from there. The last item on this chart is actually, under policy, I wouldn't have to ask you to vote to cover a deficit of $7,200. But because the health services account is, uh, or the health services budget is one sub account on its own, if we don't do a transfer to this line, then that whole little subcategory will be uh, in a deficit state. And you can see that actually, if you flip to page two of this, you can see all the categories, the voter categories are the 11 large ones on the left column. But then the subcategories, health services would actually be under budget as its own individual category if we didn't do a transfer, um, which is not, uh, it's not illegal, but I think it's, uh, it's helpful to have at least a positive fund balance in each one of the categories. So um, that is... The budget transfer picture. This is a summary that's basically the same thing that you're seeing on the second page of the handout. 
Um, one of the questions that came up in our meeting earlier was, you know, typically how many accounts do we have? How many budget transfers are typical? And it's a good question. And I just took a quick look back earlier and, and last year we had six accounts. The total value of the transfer was about $92,000. The year before that it was nine accounts, just under $200,000. The year before that it was 10 accounts, $235,000. So, I mean, it, it's sort of that same ballpark of a, a, a small number of accounts that, that we really need to tackle to make sure that we're staying in compliance with this, um, with this policy. All right, so on the second page of the handout, this chart is sort of a simplified version of it. This chart on the, on the slide only shows the 11 voter categories. The chart on page two of the transfer handout actually shows the, the detail. It shows all those subcategories that make up the 11 categories. There were some transfers between voter categories, none in excess of the uh, statutory allowed amounts. You can see that 4.99% on transportation, um, which is, we're, we're sneaking in under the threshold there. Um, and that, that's something that the auditors take a look at too because it's a statutory requirement that, that we follow that. The last page of the transfer sheet or the transfer handout describes two sets of mid-year transfers that we did. A little bit of detailed information on these. Um, one, uh, the first set of transfers was done to move staff course reimbursement. Uh, we budget course reimbursement funds in each individual building and special education. And we consider that to be one large pool of funding available under the contract to teachers and ed techs and we allow them to be reimbursed for courses based on their um, education plan which is filed with the central office and approved. Um, what happens though is that the State Department of Education wants to see course reimbursement described based on the building where the staff member actually resides, where the staff member works. So we're guessing where to put the money in the budget um, as I said in the Finance Committee, we, in the good old days, we had one big district-wide account and everybody was happy with that and it all made sense and then uh, reporting got more complicated and so what we've had to do is to divide it out amongst the buildings and then in order not to have a big deficit in one building and a surplus in another building, we smooth that out um, internally at year end ourselves so that, um, so that everything balances and there's no, there's no cross-category transfers there except for special education. There's one other item that affects the cross category transfers in, in total and that is at the middle school in the spring um, when they started working on or continued working on grading and reporting and uh, making changes so that they could more clearly communicate their systems to parents and to the community. They found that power school was not really working the way that they needed it to and that they felt they needed some really intense professional development and um, some extra training to make that happen. At the time, it was already the spring of 18 and their staff development line uh, was not particularly robust at that moment, but they did have discretionary funds available in other accounts so that <coughs> on that third page, you see a number of small transfers, all of which went toward bulking up the middle school staff development line so that they could afford um, the power school training. So now I'm showing you a slide which is way too little to see, I think, but we are back onto the financial statement. May, may I ask you a question before you move on? Sure. <coughs> With regards to staff course reimbursement, you mentioned that the budgeted amount according to contract is, is what is available to the staff to use. Are you telling us by this that it has been overspent uh, or that, that do I read it that middle school staff course reimbursement was subsidized 
by other staff reimbursements from other buildings? Yes, I think that's exactly the way to put it. Um, in the aggregate, the pool of funds was not overexpended. Okay. It was the location of the spending <coughs> that needed to be adjusted. <laughs> and if it, when, if right, it were all... It, in the contract, it doesn't specify by, by building. So exactly. Just, you know, having negotiated that, I wanted to make certain that no, we weren't gone yeah. over yeah, so there, the contract. Thank you. Right. And there's no spending in excess of the available funds. It's simply where we're reporting the funds coming from. And right. we, we make our best guess based on, pe based on people's, it's our knowledge of people's interests. But, but that's okay. Yeah. Now that I understand it, I'm fine. Okay. Um, so now I'm putting us back on to page three of the financial statement, the other handout, summing up, up expenditures. Um, this uh, projection is a little small. I think everybody might have it in their hands, so um, that's great, and we'll also be posting that. Two things to note about this handout. At the top it says it's pending audit. Um, we will have auditors coming in to tell us how good a job we've done on fiscal 18 and if there are changes that they make then um, we will um, be making those changes before we post this as a final report and before the audit is completed. Um, it also says budget balances will be updated after the school board transfers. So this particular statement does not include the transfers that I just talked about. So like as a quick example, you can take a look at extracurricular under other instruction and in the budget balance you can see a big fat deficit of $77,000. That's because we haven't done the transfer yet. Um, so once the transfers are voted on this evening, assuming that I have the board's permission, then I, I can update the budget figures on this statement before we post them on our website. So now I'll jump into revenues, and I, I will say, you know, I'll stop and, and take questions to please jump in if you like, or I'll take some at the end as well. I'm going a little quick here. Um, general fund revenues. So year-end general fund revenues were short of budgeted projections by $264,000. Similar to last year's report, um, we have this most significant shortfalls in um, three categories. This estimated revenue uh, section is down at the bottom of page three of the financial statement, so that's where I'm pulling this information from. Um, for the past several years, the Department of Education has been taking main care seed funds and deducting them from school GPA for students attending out-of-district special services programs. And um, it's, most of us business managers think this is kind of a weird way to do things because what they're doing is they're taking money out of state subsidy, which is supposed to be sort of a fixed number that's determined by the, by the EPS formula, and they're saying, oh, by the way, well, you're not really paying this bill over here properly, so we'll do that for you. So it was, it was a very strange uh, statute, and there was a legislation introduced last year that would have gotten rid of it and said, no, let's do this another way, but that didn't pass. So we're still having these sort of bizarre like quarterly deductions come out of our GPA. So you can't really even say that your subsidy is what you think it's going to be. Don't get me started. Um, then the next thing is state agency, client, state agency client reimbursement. State agency clients are specific students who are what you used to call wards of the state back in the olden days. And we get reimbursement for some of their education services. Uh, we get reimbursement depending on who's in our district at any given moment and what services they're receiving at any given moment. And that's notoriously difficult to project in a budget. So we did have a little bit of a shortfall there, and it was just simply based on student turnover and, and need for services. Um, then the last one is Medicaid reimbursement. And we've been talking about this in quarterly reports in finance for some time. We originally budgeted Medicaid reimbursement at $45,000. We have completely stopped billing Medicaid um, for school-based medical services because the State Department of Education cannot guarantee that they will not go to parents' and families' private insurance and bill them for school services. So there's two problems with that. One problem is that no sensible parent is going to give us informed consent 
to bill Medicaid for their child if they think that it's going to impact their own personal medical insurance and their deductibles and their caps and, and costs for their own family. Why would they? Um, secondly, if we were to do that and a parent was being billed for services provided at school, is that actually a violation of a free and appropriate public education? Because we're not charging a regular ed student for the services that we're providing to that student at school. So there's uh, philosophical problems, there's bureaucratic problems, um, there's numerous reasons why Medicaid reimbursement in the model that it stands right now with the State Department of Education does not work. And so in fiscal 19, we're not expecting any revenue for this. And we're just sucking it up. Luckily, we're in a position to absorb the 264,288 because you just saw the, my little dancy surplus in expenditures. Uh, so we're in good shape there. Um, if we move into the other funds section, you're going to go to page four of the financial statement. But before we head in there, I will point out at the top of that page, there's a little section for year-end fund transfers. Currently, that just shows the school nutrition transfer, which we'll talk about in a little bit. We've already looked at that fund balance transition that's labeled breakdown of general fund surplus balances. That was my first slide that we talked about, the sort of passage from the beginning to the end of the year. Uh, and now we'll move into the other fund section. And, um, oh, I'm sorry. And in the year end fund transfer section at the top, there's also a space there so that if the auditors decide that they want to make any adjustments, or if the town decides that they want to close any old CIP accounts, there's a little sort of pink spot at the top of the page there where some adjustments may happen during the audit. So adult education is on the bottom half of page four. And the adult education program finished the year with a positive fund balance again. A small shortfall in revenues was offset by savings in expenditures. The program's been working to leverage partnerships with local care facilities to provide medical courses at reduced costs to the <coughs> district. And the CNA course conti continues to be the most popular, uh, most effective course that they're doing right now, or I should say series of courses because uh, they do multiple sessions. Um, uh, in FY18, the adult ed <coughs> program served over 480 participants in over 100 enrichment courses while continuing to provide pathways to opportunity for area adults through workforce training, about 83 students, high school completion had 25 students, and English language literacy, and there were 21 students in that program. So it's, it's really um, making a big impact, I think. Next, we'll talk about school nutrition. You'll find that one at the top of page five of the financial report. So our school nutrition program ended FY18 over budget on expenditures by $8,600 due to personnel wage and benefit shifts, sort of like what we've seen in that uh, budget transfer page. While revenue projections were much closer to actuals with the welcome addition of budgeted local funding, we still experienced a revenue shortfall of about $69,000. So the second of tonight's action items will be to authorize a fund transfer. Um, we're looking for $77,894, which will be covered by general fund surplus. We're still looking at a year-end deficit for FY18, so you might feel like that's a little disappointing because we did allocate um, tax dollars to cover the, the cost of the program. But we're definitely seeing signs of improvement in the fiscal health of the department. Um, for one thing, the, the total FY18 contribution that we're asking for right here, plus the tax appropriation, so the total contribution from local funds is $34,000 and change lower than we had last year. So that means that we've made up that difference and more because we have higher costs um, in uh, food service revenues, so meal sales, food sales, and uh, USDA revenues. Forecast for the first quarter of FY19. We spent some time talking about that at our leadership uh, team last week. 
And uh, we've got some really positive trends in meal counts. We've got some uh, higher numbers in food sales. We've got some great stuff happening in breakfast. Um, in FY18, we were focused on some of the things, same things that we're focused on now, was trying to expand students' access to healthy meals, healthy snacks. Um, <coughs> added a vending machine at the high school that serves fresh food that we produce. Um, we've added some breakfast carts. We've done some interesting things to try to get food more out into the, into the hands of the kids. Um, we're working on our point of sale software. There's a feature that will allow uh, parents and teachers and anybody to access <coughs> menus and find out more information about the nutritional content of the foods. Um, from a phone app if they want to, um, and they'll also be available online ordering for staff, which is kind of exciting. Um, and we're, we're really spending a lot of time talking about breakfast um, because uh, it ties in well with our, our um, data analysis about how things are changing with the, with the new start times. So that's what we've been focused on, as well as the backpack program, which, um, you know, I continually bring that up because it's such an amazing gift to the community, funded pretty much 100% by donations and, um, you know, with some volunteer labor from our staff and uh, continues to grow, continues to provide healthy food to our kids and their families over breaks and, and even long weekends and, you know, any time that we're worried that there might be some food insecurity out there. Um, this is also a moment for me to make a pitch. I don't have to defend a very large deficit, so I'm happy about that. But I, I always like to defend any deficit in this program because I really feel like we have to remember that the mission of this program is to support our kids so that they can have access to their education. If they're not healthy, if they're not well fed, they are not going to access learning. And so spending $200,000, $300,000 on a program like that that serves 3,000 kids on 182 days a year, that's pretty remarkable. So, so there. All right, capital projects is the last page of the financial report. And uh, most of our projects on here you'll see are sort of multi-year projects. There are ongoing areas of investment, things like roofing and flooring and building envelope. Building envelope means the outside of your building, so like windows and masonry and things like that. Um, HVAC and mechanical. So most of these have a balance at the beginning of the year and a balance at the end of the year because the work goes on and on. Um, in this, as we had in last year's report, there's one area with a significant unspent balance at year end. That's security and access management. And I think we talked about this last year. We, we budgeted several years ago for emergency generators at the K-2 schools. Then we deferred that project because we were focusing on the long range planning and you know, where were the K-2 schools going, where were we gonna get help for construction. Um, and for a number of reasons, we said, well, let's not just make that investment right now. I, it looks like we're going to be making the investment um, at least at one or two of the schools based on the IT department's disaster recovery plan, which is actually a town school project uh, that looks like that's going forward this year. And uh, some of that might need some of the facilities at the K-2s, uh, so we may see some spending there. Apart from that, the year-end balances are going to reflect um, summer work that happened after June 30th, and also just allow us to keep a, a responsible, incremental repair and replacement schedule from year to year for our existing infrastructure, caring for that existing infrastructure, while we also look at long-range facilities planning and you know, figure out next steps in the big picture. All right, so that's really the end of the financial report. If we look forward a little bit, what's happening next, we're gonna have a fiscal 19 first quarter report, which we'll share with the school board finance committee at our next meeting, which we just decided was November 5th, I think. Yes, at 4.30. Um, I will be uploading first quarter financials to the Department of Education next week. I do that on a quarterly basis as well. Um, the town auditors will be joining us for field work the week of November 5th. Um, so they actually come in and hang out with us and review all our documentation and pull invoices and 
throw paper around and, and see if we did a good job. And uh, the other thing we're going to do at our next finance committee meeting will be to talk about our budget development calendar for FY20. Here we go in two years, three years. Uh, including our plans to try to continue collaborating with the town council, you know, with the joint finance committee that's been so successful and some of the outreach pieces that have been, we feel really successful in the past year. Um, uh, so we'll be building our calendar and kind of mapping out how that's going to look going forward. Um, thinking about FY19, standing in the middle of the two years, um, there's a couple of things that are coming to, to the fore. Uh, some financial challenges and some opportunities that we'll be facing as we go through fiscal 19 and start conversations about fiscal 20. We were all very excited to see our school budget pass referendum on the first ballot this past spring. I'm not sure excited is even the word, like astounded maybe or uh, delighted anyway. And we're conscious we're working with a lean budget, but we're hopeful we can continue to earn the community's support in this fiscal year and the next. Um, just some of the things that we're thinking about right now as, as school leaders, talking about increasing enrollment, especially at the K-2 schools. Um, we heard some comments about that earlier this evening. Also at grades three through eight, we've made some position reductions in uh, staff reductions in the current fiscal year due to enrollment, which then if enrollment begins to increase again, you have to revisit those and say, well, okay, maybe we're going in the other direction. Um, one of the things Julie and I talk about a lot is staff turnover. We have a lot of staff members, as we've said in the past, who are reaching their retirement age. And um, we have uh, a cohort of young people coming up into the workforce who don't want to be teachers. So we are hopeful that, we, uh, that our staff turnover can be managed with you know, excellent, qualified, capable candidates. Um, in our teaching staff as we start to lose some of our more veteran uh, staff members. Um, no help from the state on facilities, renovation, or replacement. I don't really know that that's 100% true, but I, I think, you know, you, could, you can safely say that, right? We're, yeah, there, there's no unless, unless, how many people fall off the list? Uh, uh, our K-2, surprisingly, are higher on the list than the middle school. They're like in the 30s, the mid-30s, and the middle school is like yeah. So the good news, we have great facilities. Um, the bad news is they're not great enough for us to actually provide our programming the way that we'd like to, but uh, we're kind of on our own as far as making changes to make that happen. Um, and then the last one is uh, actually both bus drivers and substitute, substitute teachers were having a hard time hiring. Um, the transportation is a much more visible concern for the community, but sub substitute teachers are... Um, well, first of all, we hired about 10 of them uh, for full-time positions this year, uh, some of our best subs. But it's hard to find subs as well because the job market is so strong right now that, you know, I don't really need to be a, a per diem worker. I can go out and get a full-time job. Um, then we've got a few positive things, you know, some great opportunities that, that are facing us as we go into thinking about FY20. We've got that year-end fund balance, again, doing the dance. Um, personnel turnover, while it's difficult in terms of, you know, sustaining the quality of our staff, it does also create some savings, as we saw in FY18. And then the last bullet that I put up here was that now that we've hit minimum receiver status um, on state aid to public schools, we are not likely to see our subsidy decrease. We are likely to see our subsidy increase because it is now currently solely based on our special ed costs, which obviously go up every year. So that's a positive. And that's pretty much all the things I can think of to talk about. Um, I put the action items up here. I think Leanne's gonna lead the charge on that, but I'll also just take a pause and see if all of that data dump created any immediate questions. Um, and I also volunteer myself to answer them later on when you wake up in the night and go, what did she say? Mm -hmm. um, Kate, I just wanted you to clarify. I, th I think I'm going to be right when I say this, but that's why I want you to clarify it. Um, but also for people who may be watching at home, when you say, for instance, there's a deficit in one line item and you take it from another, 
It's because there's a surplus in the other item, not that you're actually taking funding from that item. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, so if okay. you looked at every account at the year at, at the year end and the balance at the end, mm -hmm. the accounts that are in the green there or the yellow where we're saying we're going to take money and give it to an account right. with a deficit, those are accounts that have a surplus um, by nature already. Right. Okay, so that means that in those accounts, we came in under budget mm -hmm. in the same way that we came in over budget on the pink ones. Right. So yes, absolutely. Okay. We're Thank not you. taking away money to create a deficit somewhere else. Right. We're using a surplus. Other thoughts? Mm -hmm. I know I had at our finance meeting, I had a number of questions, but, <laughs> but you answered them either. But well, and, and again, you know, we'll, we'll post this online and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not averse to chatting about exciting things like this for hours on end. So um, <laughs> anybody who has questions once they've had a chance to read through it, um, I will take some time after the budget transfers are, are authorized to make those corrections to the statements. And then so we'll have them posted up in the next few days. Um, and then after the audit has finished. I don't think I gave the timeline for the audit. That was one of the questions. We, the auditors come to visit us the first week of November, but then they continue with their work uh, with us and with the town until the end of December, and then they issue their report um, usually by the December 31st at midnight. And um, then sometime in January, February, we typically have a public meeting with the town council and the school board where the audit is presented by the auditors and they come in and answer questions and um, they do a, their own presentation. So um, Stimulating. It is, isn't it? I think it's your favorite, right, Jackie? Mm -hmm. Jackie? Jackie made me feel sad when I came in tonight with my pile and she said she didn't want to do finance tonight, but I bet you had a good time anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank You're you. welcome. Yeah. Thank you, Kate. You always do a Appreciate great it. job taking yeah. a lot of complex information and breaking it down so it's easy to understand. Talking really yeah. fast. Absolutely. And largely jargon free. Good yes. job. Um, if I'm allowed to dance, then I will win. No. <laughs> so moving on to 12 no, point. Not yet. Yes, I have um, two well, motions to make. Oh, but that was 12.6. Oh. Point. That was really Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. So moving on to 12.6.1 and 12.6.2. Um, Leanne? Um, I'd like to combine the two into one motion. Move approval to authorize budget transfers for accounts overspent by more than $10,000 for the details provided to the school board by the business office. And then move approval to transfer $77,894 from general fund year-end fund balance to cover the school nutrition fund deficit. Second. Thank you. <laughs> Any discussion? You know, I, I know of school districts that at the end of the year uh, send a notice to parents uh, about school nutrition deficits and if there's suggesting that if they would like, if there are surplus funds in their child's account, that they donate that back to the nutrition program. We've never requested that mm -hmm. of, of parents in our town. I don't know whether they would be amenable to it or not, but it's just a thought going forward for the new board. There are, I think there were three communities who are serving on main school boards with me uh, who are doing that mm -hmm. and uh, successfully doing that to the tune of six eight thousand dollars i think we had talked about this one other time i think part of the problem in scarborough is that you your child's lunch account carries through all 12 years so if you have a x you know if you have ten dollars at the end of the year you can use it this it, next it's year. yeah you can use it the following year i pop back going, up here right um, I, I did want to say that just um, very informally, I know that it is a practice that if a, a family has funds when their child graduates, we'll gladly give the money back 
if they have money on their account. But we also have many people who say, just you know, apply it to another child's account, apply it, apply it to a needy child's account. So that happens sort of uh, organically, but you're right. I mean, a, a, it could be made more apparent that that's an option. Mm -hmm. Are we ready for a vote? Um, all those in favor of the following motions? Four and one. And, and with that, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Four and one. We're adjourned.